great. It looks like it's about 12.01, so I think we'll get started here as folks slowly continue to join us. Um, welcome to the first University of Washington Department of Medicine Grand Rounds of 2023. We're excited to get back to our regular programming and learn about some of the biggest issues affect our world today within medicine. My name is Hao Tong, and I'm one of the Internal Medicine Chief Residents at the University of Washington Montlake Campus. Today, I have the utmost pleasure of introducing our speaker. Uh, Dr. Owen West is a professor in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine. He did his residency training at the Boston University Medical Center, completed his MPH at Harvard School of Public Health, and did his pulmonary and critical care fellowship at the University of Washington. He is a pulmonologist and intensivist at Harborview Medical Center. Um, and Dr. West's trans, uh, translational research program focuses on lung infections and sepsis. He has a particular interest in meliodosis. He directs the UW's Intersect Initiative, a program that focuses on lung disease and critical illness in the context of global health. Today, Dr. West will be talking to us about meliodosis. And for everyone joining, We'll hold all questions until the end of the talk, but please send them over via the chat box below as they come up. With that said, I'll hand it over to Dr. West. Hello. And thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon uh, talking to you about melioidosis, a neglected but emerging global threat. So hopefully, you can all hear me okay. I don't have any disclosures to tell you about. And, uh, and first, for those who don't know, let me just say off the bat, melioidosis is a tropical infection caused by Burkholderia pseudomallei. And uh, I hope today to really hit four objectives. First is to describe some of the clinical features and uh, management of melioidosis. Uh, second, to underscore some of the mark disparities in the outcomes of meliodosis patients in different parts of the world. Uh, third, to uh, discuss the global endemicity of Burkholderia pseudomallei and meliodosis uh, that is evolving. And lastly, to provide you with an update on some of the uh, recent cases of meliodosis that have occurred in the United States, and also um, talk a little bit about Burkholderia pseudomallei specifically in the environment in the United States. So uh, really all of the work that I'm gonna show you today has been collaborative uh, in nature. And uh, here are some of the uh, people who ha I have worked closely with and who have really allowed um, us to put together the, the, the uh, research that I'm gonna show you today. Um, so they are uh, wonderful uh, collaborators and friends, Derek Limitharotsical, Narisra Chantratita, Sharon Peacock, uh, Susie Dunahy, and uh, Somri Nem uh, in uh, Thailand, uh, the UK, and Cambodia. So you're going to see work that really reflects uh, um, participation from all of these uh, individuals. So melioidosis, uh, or Burkholderia pseudomallei infection, really was uh, identified uh, first just uh, 112 years ago uh, in Rangoon, uh, Burma. Um, and at that point uh, in time, uh, the pathologist uh, Whitmore and Krishnaswamy uh, noted that in um, uh, post-mortem examinations of emaciated morphine users, there was a rather um, uh, unusual disease um, that looked like glanders, an abscess-forming uh, infection of horses. And this is a lung um, image from uh, their original paper with uh, the sort of necrotic abscess, uh, abscesses appearing in the lung. And uh, Whitmore and Krishnaswamy uh, isolated the bacterium that was uh, responsible for this uh, infection from these individuals. And they found that it was slightly different from, from uh, glanders, which was uh, another abscess forming disease uh, commonly seen those days in horses. Um, uh, but there were some similarities in the clinical presentations. So they named this new bacillus, bacillus pseudomallei, because the glanders uh, bacterium was at that time called bacillus mallei. Uh, 
So Bacillus pseudomallei was, was, was identified by Whitmore and Krishnaswamy then, and uh, it's a, a gram-negative rod. Um, and the, the term melioidosis for the disease uh, that B. pseudomallei causes is, uh, was coined by Stanton and Fletcher uh, some years later after an infection of a, an animal research facility in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, and they called it melioidosis for uh, a disease like a distemper of asses. So there's been this sort of long relationship between uh, B. mallei and B. pseudomallei. Um, now, uh, since that time, uh, we know that B. mallei, and I should say it's been renamed on several occasions, uh, Pseudo Pseudomonas pseudomallei, uh, and now most recently, Burkholderia pseudomallei. We know that this organism is, exists in the environment and across the tropics. And um, in the years following um, uh, the, the actual naming of the disease, um, the uh, infection melioidosis was found throughout Asia and then also in Australia. And a lot of attention uh, was given to it uh, because it was detected in uh, GIs returning from Vietnam. It was called the Vietnam time bomb. Uh, because it could cause chronic disease or uh, even reactivation. Um, and we now know that the, uh, the, the bacterium Burkholderia pseudomallei is a facultatively intracellular uh, flagellated gram-negative um, organism. And as mentioned, it's an environmental saprophyte. So it lives in the soil and water in the tropics. Now, uh, complicating matters a little bit is that it, it's quite uh, resistant to many antibiotics and causes, as we're going to discuss, rather severe disease. And so as a result, the CDC and USDA have labeled it a tier one select agent. And um, this also reflects concern about its potential misuse as a bio threat agent. Although, as I'm gonna tell you, it's really a very active public, public health threat, but its stat uh, status as a select agent means that there's enhanced federal uh, oversight and regulations uh, related to working with this organism and um, studying the infection. I'm going to talk mostly about human infection in uh, this talk, but I want to point out that all of the animals that you see here on this slide uh, have been infected with uh, Burkholderia pseudomallei and have uh, had uh, melioidosis as a result. Um, it, it, there's some debate about whether it's really a zoonotic pathogen in that, uh, in that th there's not a lot of clearly documented cases where humans have been directly infected by animals. Uh, but there's no question that animals being infected can contaminate the environment and uh, therefore um, uh, lead to exposure to humans. How do you get melioidosis? Well, there are three major routes of infection um, uh, that have been identified. And so the first is inhalation of the aerosolized pathogen. Um, so you can imagine that in um, rainy or windy uh, conditions, the organism in the soil uh, and water is whipped up and there's, uh, there are aerosols that can be inhaled. And in fact, Burkholderia pseudomallei has been isolated from the air, both in Australia and from Taiwan. Um, a second route of infection is percutaneous inoculation. And so uh, people walking uh, with abraded skin or cuts in their skin in contaminated areas uh, may be exposed that way. And then finally, uh, a more recently identified route of infection is ingestion. Uh, and this could occur, for example, by consumption of contaminated well water. Um, the manifestations of melioidosis are myriad. And I think this is a, a key, key message to, to tell you. It, this infection, although it was originally described as an abscess forming uh, infection, um, and it certainly is, it can really infect almost any uh, part of the body. The most common manifestations of infection, though, are pneumonia and bacteremia. Um, but certain groups like kids in Thailand are more likely to get parotid abscesses, uh, for example. Um, the, uh, the bacteremia is a common um, uh, presentation uh, as well. And I think the, the other... Uh, wrinkle in terms of trying to identify melioidosis is that the disease can really be acute or chronic or potentially reactivate. Uh, so most cases are acute in that there is an exposure that occurs uh, in the days preceding illness uh, and uh, people 
can often have quite a fulminating course with sepsis and shock. Um, uh, there are also more chronic and more indolent forms uh, and uh, of disease, although those are less common. And lastly, then this uh, reactivation is, uh, is a phenomenon where people have been exposed to the disease, I'm sorry, exposed to the infection at some point, and then uh, at some later stage, they have reactivation. Um, although, again, that seems to be a less common. It can be a little bit hard to tease out when that occurs, though, because most cases of melioidosis occur in patients who have continuous exposure to a contaminated environment. So while melioidosis has been identified around the, the tropics, and I'm going to get into this in a little more detail later, much of what we know about the epidemiology and uh, management and outcomes from this infection uh, are due to work performed at two hyperendemic spots. And this is one of them in Darwin, Australia, specifically at the Royal Darwin Hospital here on the top end, um, where a group led by Bart Curry has for many decades been studying melioidosis. And uh, they recently published their experience, which is really a summation of 30 years worth of of, of work caring for melioid patients in uh, their, their uh, single center. They reported here on over 1,100 cases in the 30 years. And um, I'm going to uh, present a little more information uh, in, in later slides that they have generated um, that is, is extremely valuable. But the second uh, hyperendemic uh, uh, location where melioidosis uh, occurs and um, this is an area where I have spent quite a bit of time collaborating with, uh, with colleagues, uh, is in Northeast Thailand. And so Thailand is an, up now an upper middle income country with a fairly um, uh, sophisticated healthcare uh, system. The Northeastern or Isan region of Thailand, however, is uh, it's the largest and it also uh, has the lowest per capita income. Major industry is, is agriculture and uh, there's a lot of rice farming as you can see in this picture. Uh, and it's well known that Burkholderia pseudomallei uh, exists in uh, rice paddies and soil and water uh, here uh, throughout this northeast region. And so this is a hyperendemic zone. Uh, some 7,000 melioidosis patients were identified by colleagues Virya Hantrakun and Derek Limitharotsikal um, over a four year period throughout all of Thailand. Um, and uh, the majority of these, nearly 5,500 of them, were in this northeastern um, region. And uh, in this northeast region, with this uh, pathogen um, uh, in the environment, uh, in the soil and water, um, not surprisingly, there is widespread seropositivity to the, to the organism. And so this uh, data here is from quite a few years ago, but it is... Uh, um, a measure of seropositivity to Burkholderia pseudomallei in children um, using an indirect hemagglutin and assay. Uh, and you can see that within a couple of years after birth, there is fairly uh, a high, there's a high rate of uh, detectable titers to B pseudomallei in uh, children. Um, subsequent, more recent work done by Susie Dunahy. Uh, has uh, further shown that in this northeastern region of Thailand, about 38% of healthy blood donors are uh, seropositive, and that's using an, a titer of 1 to 80. Um, and looking at uh, age and gender, uh, there are no real differences in seropositivity, but non-urban residents and being a rice farmer uh, was associated with a higher rates of seropositivity. So what this means is that most people uh, we think in places like Northeast Thailand, where the environment is uh, hosts Burkholderia pseudomallei, are exposed uh, to infection. Yet, most of them do not get infection. And uh, really, melioidosis is an infection, is an opportunistic infection. It's an infection of people with uh, risk factors. Uh, the major risk factor is diabetes. Uh, and this study from Derek Limitharotsikal uh, performed in Thailand compared the incidence rates uh, of melioidosis in non-diabetics and in people with diabetes. And you can see that non-diabetics had an incidence rate that was about seven, whereas people, uh, diabetic patients had an incidence rate that was uh, 146. Uh, 
So there is this rather remarkable relative risk um, for getting melioidosis if you are a diabetic of 12. Uh, that really uh, exceeds uh, the relative risk of getting any other infection uh, if you're diabetic. I think the closest competitor is tuberculosis where the relative risk is something like three. And so it really speaks to the, uh, uh, the, the enhanced susceptibility amongst diabetics. Now, that's not the only risk factor, however, chronic renal, lung, um, uh, I see I wrote renal and kidney, uh, well, both, yes. Chronic renal, lung, uh, heart uh, diseases uh, all increase uh, the, uh, the risk of meliodosis as well, as does alcohol use disorder, uh, particularly, in Northern, uh, particularly in, in Northern Australia, and then some other conditions like thalassemia, cancer, and uh, chronic steroid use. Um, now, uh, among patients with meliodosis, how, how is the diagnosis made? Well, the culture remains the gold standard for uh, uh, diagnosis. And this can be a little bit challenging because uh, sometimes serial cultures are negative. Uh, sometimes the organism is misidentified even by automated uh, systems or mass spec. Um, nonetheless, uh, uh, culture is really, um, nothing has approached culture yet, uh, uh, so it is the gold standard. There are some other more uh, useful point of care uh, assays in certain circumstances um, that include a lateral flow assay that detects um, capsular polysaccharide of the um, uh, of, of the Burkholderia pseudomalia, and this is actually commercially available from a a company in Seattle, although it is impaired by a lack of sensitivity, um, depending on the clinical sample that's used. And then there are actually several different antibody um, tests that are under evaluation as point of care uh, devices, uh, multiplex antibody dis dipstick and immunochromatography uh, um, tests, such as the one shown in the picture here are under evaluation. And, and these are actually antibody tests. And you might think that antibody testing is not very likely to be very helpful in a population that's that's uh, already got seropositivity to Burkholderia pseudomaliae. But it actually turns out that the IgG response, which is what these are measuring, is quite rapid in patients in Northeast Thailand, at least with culture-proven melioidosis. And that these, uh, these tests uh, still seem to be helpful in differentiating people with acute disease versus people who have just been exposed um, based on uh, uh, living in, in, in an area where the uh, organism is uh, in the environment. Um, PCR on clinical samples is not really routinely used um, and uh, in the old days, uh, the indirect hemagglutination assay that I mentioned before for determining seropositivity has been used as a diagnostic, but this is not currently recommended. Um, there are also some, some adjuncts to culture, such as a latex agglutination test or immunofluorescence antibody that can be used once um, an organism has grown in culture and uh, in order to help uh, uh, identify the isolate. For patients with a confirmed diagnosis of meliodosis, or frankly, for those in whom it is suspected, it's important to consider the appropriate management. And um, Burkholderia pseudomalii is intrinsically resistant to a variety of different uh, antibiotics, penicillins, first and, generation, first and second generation cephalosporins, macrolides, rifamycins, colistin, the aminoglycosides, and um, really the agents of choice uh, for intensive phase early therapy are intravenous ceftazidime or carbapenems, meropenem, or imipenem. And in fact, antibiotic treatment is divided into two phases. There's an intensive phase up front with typically a, an intravenous uh, drug as described, and then that's followed by an eradication phase that lasts several months. Um, also, for the intensive phase, you can add on trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, uh, which is used for the eradication phase typically, but it can be added in the intensive phase. Uh, the Australian guidelines suggest using it for non-pulmonary foci of, of infection, um, although in Thailand that's not used as, as frequently in part because some trials have not really demonstrated a benefit. In addition, uh, abscess drainage, source control, um, and usual sepsis care, fixing deranged physiology and organ support are, of course, um, key elements of uh, appropriate um, care of meliodosis patients. 
I just want to mention that the duration of therapy here has evolved over recent years. And I've just showed you the guidelines from the Australian um, uh, group in, in Darwin uh, recommending that the minimum intensive phase duration be two weeks, but potentially increase all the way up to eight weeks for CNS or arterial infection. Um, pneumonias, depending on the complexity, range from two to four weeks of intensive IV treatment. Uh, and that's longer than what patients in Thailand receive. They typically receive 10 to 14 days. And the Australians, I think, have been able to make this work successfully by using home infusion uh, systems to administer uh, the IV drugs uh, outside the hospital. And then the eradication phase is typically at least three months and ranging up to six months of infection. I'll just mention fluoroquinolones here. Um, uh, while Burkholderia pseudomalii may actually be susceptible in vitro, they have not really shown to be very beneficial in clinical trials, so they are not recommended. So we conducted a study to try to define in more detail the characteristics and outcomes of patients with melioidosis in Northeast Thailand. Uh, in recent years. And this was a project done with Nurissa Chantratita. And we did this at nine centers, um, uh, enrolling patients at least eight, 15 years of age with cult culture proven infection. We did this between 2015 and 2018. And then we followed them for one year. Uh, and the um, uh, flow chart of the study is here shown on the left at 2,500 odd patients screened and enrolled about and analyzed to 1,352. And the uh, Patient characteristics were similar to what has been previously reported in that they are, were uh, median age of 55 years. Uh, the vast majority, 72%, the large majority were, were male. 70% um, had diabetes. And that number actually has been increasing over time in Northeast Thailand, the number of meliodosis patients who have diabetes. Um, so this is one of the highest uh, rates. And in fact, even um, in patients without diabetes, the majority of patients had some sort of a risk factor for meliodosis. Only 13% did not have a risk factor for, uh, uh, for meliodosis. So this really suggests that the, uh, uh, this is a disease of patients with risk factors. Um, and we then looked at what the outcomes were. And uh, I should tell you that these patients... Um, uh, many of them were transferred from other smaller facilities in the Thai referral system. Um, of the 841 patients who were at other hospitals, about 41% had received a recommended IV antibiotic against B. pseudomalii. At the study hospitals, about 97% received uh, that appropriate IV antibiotic, uh, typically within the first day. Um, and that was mostly ceftazidine. But the, over the outcomes here are, are really rather sobering. Um, 41% uh, of patients needed mechanical ventilation, 33% uh, needed pressors or, or um, uh, inotropic agents. 25% um, of patients died, that's 335 of our patients died within uh, one month of enrollment, and 34% died uh, at one year. And if you look at the top right, you'll see the survival is stratified, not surprisingly, by, by age. Um, but even in survivors, almost a quarter of them needed to be readmitted to the hospital. Uh, and that, those readmissions, if you look at the bottom panel on the right, took place uh, really qu qu quite um, uh, in a fashion that was quite spread out over the follow-up time period. Um, so these uh, numbers suggested that uh, the burden of meliodosis in Northeast Thailand is uh, is really very significant, uh, and it lingers uh, perhaps um, for for the really for for quite a while following uh, discharge from the hospital initially. Um, fortunately, very few patients, only two percent, had recurrence, and recurrence has been a concern in the past when patients mm -hmm. have not received uh, adequate courses uh, of uh, of therapy. Um, it's been up in the thirteen. 15% sort of range, uh, but uh, in this uh, study with active surveillance, we found only 2% of patients had, had recurrence. So that was one bright spot. But this overall speaks to just the heavy burden of meliodosis in, uh, in Northeast Thailand. And I would also just point out that 
335 patients died at one month, but we also did not enroll 324 patients who were screened because they died prior to enrollment. So these were patients who cultures came back positive for melioidosis, but they had already died. So our estimates of mortality here are probably uh, quite uh, low. And in fact, other estimates of mortality uh, from melioidosis in Northeast Thailand are closer to 40%. Of patients with melioidosis, lung infection is the most common and the most lethal. And uh, uh, we found that about 42% of our patients had lung infection, often in association with bacteremia or shock. This doubled the risk of death uh, and um, I think speaks to the lung tropism of Burkholderia pseudomaliae and is also why uh, uh, my group is so interested in trying to understand the pulmonary host response in melioidosis. Uh, this is really um, a, a Lung infection is a particularly severe manifestation of melioidosis and unfortunately the most common with a, between 40 to 50% of patients in other studies presenting with, with pneumonia. So uh, we completed our study recently and actually found it instructive to compare it to the uh, Australian experience. And in fact, we when we uh, wrote our paper, we ultimately um, did uh, presented the data in such a way that it would allow um, quite direct comparison with the, the Darwin Northern Australian experience. And in general, uh, age, gender, and clinical presentations were largely comparable across the two uh, studies, uh, each of you know, well over a thousand patients. We, uh, there were more diabetic patients in our cohort in Thailand, also more bacteremia and accompanying organ failure. But most striking, the case fatality rate in our cohort of at least 25%, and as I mentioned, that's probably an underestimate of all patients with melioidosis, was uh, markedly higher than what the Australians are currently reporting, which is a mortality rate of 6% in the last few years. So uh, very few uh, patients now with melioidosis in, uh, at least at this one site in Northern Australia, uh, die, uh, whereas it's still uh, massively impactful in Northeast Thailand. So we concluded here that our patients were preventing very, presenting very sick. Many of the deaths were early, and this really underscored the importance of identifying these patients early, triaging them appropriately, and starting a, a, the correct clinical management. More generally, this really speaks to the importance of better sepsis care in low- and middle-income countries. It's probably not just limited to melioidosis, of course, but um, this is, I think, uh, uh, melioidosis is, uh, is an exemplar of, of sepsis uh, that plagues low uh, and middle income countries and under-resourced regions around the world and has been woefully uh, studied to date, unfortunately. So the prior study that I showed you recruited uh, just melioid patients um, after they had a positive culture. And of course, we missed some patients who had died or had left the uh, uh, gone home or, or um, uh, some other, other reasons. Um, so we also conducted a study to try to capture patients with sepsis, including melioidosis um, in Northeast Thailand, both to understand a little bit more about the um, uh, characteristics and uh, um, management of sepsis in this region, um, and also to allow us to compare, say, Burkholderia pseudomaliae to some of the other bacteremias um, in the uh, in in the region, and so this was a study that was conducted by Virya Hantrakun and Derek Limitharotsikol and myself. We did it between two, 2013 and 2017. It was a single center study at Sapasadithi Prasong Hospital here in the top left in Uban Ratchathani in the Asan region. And although it was a single center uh, study, we captured patients who were referred to Sapasad Hospital from over 60 facilities in the region. We screened nearly 29,000 patients and enrolled 5,000 uh, into the study and followed them for uh, 28 days. And uh, this was a very useful study for, for um, uh, a number of different re reasons. Uh, one thing we looked at was we compared Burkholderia bacteremia to other common causes of bacteremia. And in this region, um, E. coli bacteremia is the most common, followed by B. pseudomaliae bacteremia, followed by um, staph aureus bacteremia, and staph is the most common gram-positive uh, bacteremia that's identified. And 
Um, Ranjani Somayaji, now at University of Calgary, worked with us to do this analysis, comparing outcomes uh, amongst these different uh, bacteremias in this Ubon sepsis cohort. And you can see that E. coli mortality is 19%, Staph aureus 43%, and a really depressing 66% mortality amongst patients with Burkholderia pseudomallei bacteremia in this cohort. And these were patients, remember, who had been enrolled really at the time um, or close to the time of admission within 24 hours. So before we knew what their infection would be, uh, if any. Um, so it was a prospective recruitment. And uh, this, um, I think, uh, demonstrates the particular virulence of Burkholderia pseudomallei. Um, uh, unfortunately, but again, underscores just the, the burden of this infection, particularly in this region. Now, I also want to tell you about melioidosis and tuberculosis, because tuberculosis is, of course, uh, a major global concern. And many of the countries where TB is endemic are also uh, places where melioidosis may be endemic. And this is a picture on the right of a melioidosis patient uh, uh, and panel A and a tuberculosis patient in panel B. And it may be tough to figure out what your patient has just by looking at the, the, um, the, the imaging. Uh, so uh, we were interested in trying to figure out how many patients who might have TB um, actually could have melioidosis in a melioidosis endemic environment. And so for this, we uh, worked with uh, Dr. Somari Nem and Yati Fo in uh, Cambodia. Um, and others, including people, uh, uh, partners at the Diagnostic Microbiology Development Program. And, and they actually support a microbiology lab uh, that uh, runs very well at Kampong Cham Hospital here in Cambodia, along the Mekong River. Uh, and uh, one advantage of this site is that we were able to um, uh, uh, leverage the uh, microbiology uh, expertise uh, of uh, the, the micro staff there in order to uh, test sputum samples for Burkholderia pseudomallei using selective media. And at the same time, there was a very active TB diagnostic program at this hospital, which included uh, gene expert and uh, mycobacterial culture. Um, so this was a prospective single center study that we did over six months in 2015. And four, uh, 404 patients with suspected TB were enrolled. They were presenting to the hospital, either to the TB clinic or to the, uh, uh, they were admitted to a TB ward uh, with suspected tuberculosis. And they had sputum sent for um, AFB stain culture and gene expert. Uh, 52 had tuberculosis as diagnosed by gene expert or culture. So high burden of tuberculosis in these patients, but four of them had melioidosis identified by sputum culture. So about 1%. So this told us uh, that melioidosis is uh, a potential concern and can present in patients with suspected tuberculosis. Um, and of course it's treated very, very differently. And other studies since then have showed rather similar phenomena. Um, so this, I think, indicates that melioidosis uh, endemic areas, uh, which are likely to also be TB endemic areas, um, uh, are places where if you're thinking TB, you should also think melioidosis. Um, unfortunately, many of the places, even with TB detection infrastructure, don't necessarily have um, sufficient melioidosis uh, detection infrastructure, i.e., uh, diagnostic microbiology facilities. So a question we've asked is why, why is melioidosis so severe? Um, how can we identify melioidosis early um, to try to address some of the burden of disease that I've just described to you? And um, we have embarked on a multi-omic investigation using the data generated from the Ubon sepsis project. Um, in order to compare Burkholderia pseudomallei to other types of infection and also look at outcomes among patients with, with melioidosis. And, you know, we've asked what are some of the biological features of melioidosis that differ from other infections? This could help guide future investigations. And can we use some of these features, um, biological features, as diagnostic or prognostic signatures? So to this end, our group uh, shown here uh, uh, 
uh, Lu Xia, Ali Shoje, Rosen Lemaitre, and Sina Garib uh, have uh, all worked together to analyze plasma metabolomics and plasma proteomics, as well as blood leukocyte RNA sequencing data from patients from the Ubon sepsis cohort. Um, and what I'm showing you here is uh, some uh, data produced by Lu Xia here uh, uh, using the, uh, it's an analysis of our metabolomic um, data set. Um, this uh, data is uh, compares metabolomic um, profiles in meliodosis patients to patients with other forms of infection, E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Staph aureus, or culture negative uh, patients. And this UMAP plot at the top is that that condenses down um, uh, multidimensional data really into two dimensions. And you can see that in light blue, the meliodosis patients separate rather nicely from the other forms of infection um, that are identified. And um, it's possible to develop um, classifiers for um, meliodosis using these metabolomic uh, these metabolites, and the plots on the bottom show the misclassification error rate, the area under the curve, um, and the area under the curve here is one that's familiar to most people. You know that it's it's quite a high area under the curve, um, particularly when you have a um, high number of metabolites, and there doesn't seem to be much added benefit to uh, the addition of clinical data. Uh, to the, the shape of this curve. Um, also notably, you don't actually need all that many metabolites to uh, get uh, the area under the curve up pretty high. Uh, so uh, a set of five or maybe 10 metabolites may be sufficient to um, use as a, as a diagnostic tool to help identify patients with melioidosis early in their course before the actual etiology of their infection is known. So this is promising data uh, that we are currently validating. And uh, a second um, uh, omics analysis that we are currently working on um, is shown here is transcriptomic profiling. And this is work done by Pat Pong Roncard, who's a graduate student at uh, the University of Oxford, Ox Oxford working with Susie Dunahy and uh, also under the um, uh, oversight of Sina Garab. And uh, this just shows that patients um, with melioidosis um, who ultimately survive or die have quite distinct transcriptomic profiles. And what we're working on at the moment is pathway analyses to, under, to use this data to try to understand what uh, the pathways that are activated in fatal and non-fatal cases are and whether those could be uh, further investigated or exploited for therapeutic reasons. Um, and then also, can we use this transcriptomic profile for prognostic um, uh, reasons? So uh, that is work that uh, Pat Pong, known as POM, actually, uh, is, is currently doing. Um, and we are also doing something similar with proteomics and then ultimately hoping to integrate uh, all three of those omics domains together uh, for, um, uh, for a deeper, um, deeper understanding of biological um, uh, pathways in melioidosis and also to try to help us understand outcomes. Now, I've talked uh, quite a bit about melioidosis in Northeast Thailand and also told you that the top end of Australia is another hyperendemic zone, but where else is melioidosis in, in the world? And um, to date, there've been efforts to try to identify it uh, um, in, in a variety of different countries, but this was a nice paper from a few years ago, a modeling paper by Derek Lemothorotzikol and uh, folks at the IHME uh, showing um, that the environmental suitability for Burkholderia pseudomallei around the world. And you can see that large swaths of tropical regions and even subtropical regions in, in red and yellow seem to be suitable environmentally for uh, hosting Burkholderia pseudomallei. Um, and in fact, uh, the, uh, the, the investigators here estimated that the number of meliodosis cases per, per, uh, per year could range from somewhere like 68,000 to 412,000, um, which is a substantial range, but also uh, was, uh, I think, helpful for those of us uh, who suspected that meliodosis is quite widespread uh, around the world, but just hadn't really been identified in many places. 
And in fact, if you look at the confirmed global distribution of Burkholderia pseudomalia, you can see that these dots, these white dots on this map, really mimic uh, what you saw on the previous map. Um, many of the places where uh, the environment, environment is considered very suitable are in fact places where Burkholderia pseudomalia has been identified either in the environment or cases in animals or humans, uh, which are what the, the white dots show. So um, this, uh, this uh, speaks to the, the broad distribution of Burkholderia pseudomalia uh, in the tropics and the subtropics. And I'd say that over the last few decades, last two decades, there's been quite a significant increase in cases reported from areas that weren't known to be endemic um, uh, prior. Um, and um, uh, th this is shown uh, or illustrated uh, using, for example, PubMed results uh, here. So this is India is, is uh, I think, a nice example where there was a one case of meliodosis reported in the literature in 1953, and then nothing till the 1990s when there were a few cases reported. And then you can look at the more recent um, number of publications, and you can see that it's dramatically increased. And so there were 34 publications on meliodosis in 2021. And uh, I think this uh, publication uh, profile mimics or, uh, or um, tracks with the number of cases that are also being reported. And the bottom line seems to be that the more you look for this pathogen, the more you find. Uh, but because it identification of it requires culture, really, and uh, culture requires diagnostic microbiology facilities, and then the ability to interpret the what has grown and, and make the identification correctly. Um, and those um, capabilities are not available, unfortunately, uh, as much as it would be desirable throughout the world. So we suspect that Burkholderia pseudomalii is out there in much of the tropical and even subtropical regions and has yet to be identified. So it is clearly a, a, an emerging pathogen. The more you look, the more you find. Now, I do want to talk uh, here about meliodosis in the United States, because uh, there has been a lot of interest in that in the last couple of years. And so this is a graph of the number of reported cases of meliodosis to the CDC. And you can see that that's increasing. And most of these cases are those associated with a travel history to a known endemic region. Um, uh, this, uh, uh, I'll say that uh, in addition, um, the CDC uh, has investigated cases like uh, this fish tank case. Uh, in Maryland, a patient had Burkholderia pseudomalii that was ultimately associated with a contaminated fish uh, tank. The uh, pathogen was isolated from samples taken from the fish tank after the patient's fish kept dying um, and she'd buy new fish and put them in the tank and they would die again. And uh, so the fish or plants or, or something, it seemed, from Southeast Asia, which is how the bacterium was identified as, as originating from, um, uh, some uh, were, were the, the the there was an Im importation of of uh, Burkholderia pseudomalii, presumably um, is somehow related to this fish tank that ultimately led to this patient developing the the infection. Um, so this is a non-travel associated but imported uh, case. Um, there was also a. Uh, an outbreak of meliodosis in the United States in 2021 that you may have heard of. And this occurred between March and July of 2021 in four states. And none of these cases were associated with travel. The patients ranged in age from four, there were two kids actually, a four-year-old and a five-year-old up to 53. And the patients presented with very sick, uh, very severe manifestations of, of meliodosis and two died. One had very severe neurological impairment and the fourth um, was still left with some residual uh, confusion after after their um, their disease, and the CDC investigated these cases, and um, actually they went to the home of the Georgia patient and took environmental samples, and ultimately cultured Burkholderia pseudomalii from the aroma from an aromatherapy room spray shown here uh, that they found in the home of this patient. Um, and it turns out that the Texas patient was also exposed to this aromatherapy spray. Um, and this product was actually made in India. And when they did phylogenomic analysis, um, 
the uh, isolates from the patients and from the aromatherapy spray bottle all grouped here, which is in the South Asian uh, region, suggesting that indeed the Burkholderia pseudomallei uh, had uh, come from uh, that, um, that part of the world. Um, and if you look down here, you see that all four clinical isolates plus the spray isolate were essentially identical. So really providing strong, strong evidence that this aromatherapy spray was contaminated, perhaps at the point of manufacture or somewhere in India, and then uh, uh, caused significant disease, uh, often lethal disease in patients here. But the story continued because a just reported about two weeks ago is that the Texas patient had a pet raccoon uh, living uh, in, in the home that had broken uh, a bottle of this aromatherapy spray about two months before the Texas patient got sick. The raccoon developed neurological symptoms and died within a couple of weeks. Um, the CDC uh, exhumed the raccoon about a year later, as I understand it, and isolated Burkholderia pseudomallei. Well, let me correct that. They didn't isolate B. pseudomallei, but they identified B. pseudomallei using PCR in intraorbital tissue of the raccoon. So that was just another piece to this um, uh, story about uh, the contaminated aromatherapy spray. And this is actually the first time that a raccoon has been um, in, uh, infected with B. pseudomallei, uh, to, uh, to, to my knowledge. Uh, another case in 2004 was melioidosis in an 82-year-old man from Texas. He had a wound that didn't heal. It grew Burkholderia pseudomallei. He had been a World War II veteran, and the original belief was that he may have had reactivation of uh, melioidosis after being in a prisoner of war uh, camp uh, back um, decades beforehand. Um, but uh, just a few years ago, another patient um, from Texas uh, was diagnosed with melioidosis, and um, this patient um, had traveled to Mexico 30 years before, but had also spent a lot of time on his property cleaning out a, um, a water tank for water storage. And although no environmental Burkholderia was found in a CDC investigation, um, it turns out that this patient and the patient, the World War II veteran patient, were from the same county, Atascosa County in Texas. Not only that, the uh, bacteria, when sequenced, were extremely similar. And so this was highly suggestive that maybe the first case actually didn't have reactivation um, um, uh, 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 disease, but rather had um, uh, had uh, c contracted the infection from the environment. And I should point out that this, that the isolate was an American uh, isolate. It, it didn't appear to be an isolate from Southeast Asia. Um, so uh, it, B. pseudomallei was not actually identified in the environment, but this raised the possibility that these two patients in Texas, in the same county in Texas, infected with similar American strains, maybe were actually domestic infection not related to reactivation or importation. But then uh, really just this year, uh, July of 2022, um, we got this news from the CDC that in fact, Burkholderia pseudomallei was for the first time ever isolated from uh, soil and water in the Mississippi Gulf Coast region. And I say first time ever in the continental United States. We've known that uh, B. pseudomallei and melioidosis exists in uh, Puerto Rico. This is the first time in the continental U.S. And both of these patients had not had it. Uh, so there were two cases in Mississippi. Both had pneumonia and bacteremia. None had traveled internationally. And um, the organism was isolated from one of their properties uh, and seemed to be a, a Western uh, American uh, strain of Burkholderia pseudomallei. So this means that uh, the uh, organism is uh, autochthonous in the United States, um, a, a, a very significant uh, finding. So I just want to point out lastly that melioidosis is so neglected uh, though that it's not even considered a WHO neglected tropical disease. Unfortunately, it actually levies a higher burden of disease than many other official uh, neglected tropical diseases, 
but gets a lot less funding, unfortunately, for a variety of different reasons. Um, so I think that meliodosis has a PR problem, unfortunately, um, even though I think it's likely to continue to emerge and for several reasons. Uh, climate change um, tends to increase conditions that are favorable for Burkholderia pseudomaliae um, uh, in the environment. Uh, there are concerns uh, about ongoing zoonotic hazards and outbreaks related to global trade and dispersion to non-endemic areas. And some of the examples I've given you in the United States reflect that. And then also the epidemiologic transition that's occurring globally with more chronic diseases and particularly diabetes. And I give an example on the right of the number of cases of diabetes in India that are uh, predicted by 2045, going from roughly 70,000 now up to over 100, sorry, 70 million now up to over 120 million. Um, and remember that that is the major risk factor for melioidosis. So we have a lot of changes, I think, ahead of us that are likely to predispose to increased numbers of cases of melioidosis. So in conclusion, uh, I think the take home messages here are that meliodosis has a wide variety of clinical manifestations, but the pathogen Burkholderia pseudomaliae is generally opportunistic and uh, particularly in diabetics and very lung tropic. There are tremendous variations in outcomes, disparities in outcomes across, uh, well, when you compare Australia and Northeast Thailand, and I think most of the world is probably uh, dealing with outcomes that look more like the Thai experience of high, high mortality and high burden of disease. Meliodosis continues to emerge globally, but is unfortunately ultra, ultra neglected. And in the United States now, you can see disease from uh, it's associated with travel, uh, or you could see disease that's associated with uh, that's a domestically acquired either by, because it's imported or autochthonous. And if you do suspect meliodosis, because it's a tier one select agent, I'd suggest notifying the lab if it's a diagnostic consideration. And remember that melioid is a notifiable condition in Washington state. Uh, these are all the various folks I've worked with over the years who have, if not all of them, it's, uh, it's, it's many of them who have been wonderful collaborators and have allowed this uh, research to continue. And I'm very grateful. My funding is below. I'm gonna stop there and be happy to take any questions. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you, Dr. West, for uh, such a well, great talk um, on such a topic that we need to learn more about. Uh, thank you to the work that your team has been putting into learning more about the laodosis, especially in such a vulnerable population and exploring ways to really prevent the disease burden. I expect that even with a bad PR problem, like you mentioned, uh, we'll probably hear more about it over the next decade as it continues to grow. Um, we now have some time for some uh, for Q&A, so I'd love to invite everyone to submit some questions in the chat box. Uh, we've already got a few. The first um, is more broad, but as a physician scientist, uh, what uh, got you interested in meliodosis? Well, uh, serendipity uh, is the short answer there, and I've got to uh, thank Sean Skerritt, uh, my mentor, for getting me uh, interested in meliodosis many years ago. And actually, I was the benefit—I was the beneficiary of biodefense funding for meliodosis. Uh, Burkholderia pseudomaliae is considered, as I mentioned, a bio threat, and uh, in the early 2000s, there was a lot of attention paid to potential biothreat agents. But as I learned about uh, meliodosis, because Dr. Skerritt had a uh, grant to study it, uh, I realized that the public health, health ramifications, existing ramifications were, were very pr profound. And that's what got me, uh, got me uh, really off and running. Well, we'll have to get a little credit to Dr. Skerritt for that. <laughs> the next question we got um, was, what are the metabolites with highest specificity for melodosis? Do these metabolite, uh, metabolites give you insight into a unique pathophysiology versus other causes of sepsis? It's a great question. And one we are, uh, we are grappling with. Uh, we are trying to work out what these metabolites that we've measured actually are. Um, are they metabolites that are from uh, the pathogen? Are they metabolites from the human? Uh, if they're from the human, are they from uh, something that the human has, uh, that the person has uh, has taken uh, um, for uh, somehow? Um, 
and we don't know yet, and we're actually working hard to try to figure that out and, uh, and uh, really understand what it is that these metabolites really reflect. Um, it's, it's, we found it a little bit harder, uh, at least I'll say this as somebody who doesn't normally work with metabolites, it's a little bit harder to figure out where they're from than say working with genes or, or, or proteins. Um, I find it harder to wrap my arms around the metabolites, but we're working hard on that. And Rosen Lemaitre has actually been, been, been very valuable in trying to guide us there. And kind of on the topic of more granular infection, um, someone was noting that T cells seem to play a more significant role in host defense slash immunity to uh, pseudomyelii. And they were wondering how common and severe is melanodosis in HIV infected individuals and is chronic or reactivation of melanodosis more common in these individuals as well? You would think that it might well be, but actually studies do not show that melioidosis is more common in HIV infected individuals. Now, I'm not 100% convinced, I think uh, this is a view shared by some other collaborators, not 100% convinced that that's really truly the case. It may just be that studies have been a little underpowered, but there's definitely not a rip roaringly strong signal associating melioidosis of any form with HIV. And that's a puzzle because we really don't know uh, the, the reason why. Mouse models of uh, animals with, with CD4 deficiencies uh, do seem to be more susceptible. Um, so that's, that's an unanswered question, unfortunately. And in working with these populations, Dr. West, um, have you noted any methods that are most effective in preventing melodosis, um, especially, uh, for example, amongst rice field workers or others at risk? Yes. So I didn't touch on prevention. Thank you for bringing that up. It's an important, important topic. And uh, yes, the various prevention efforts have included um, trying to increase awareness amongst populations at risk, uh, trying to encourage uh, patients to wear boots or gloves, um, to avoid going outside or being exposed in the rainy season or monsoon season. Um, the problem with these is that they, the uptake of some of these recommendations has been somewhat spotty. And one big trial actually done by Derek Lemathorotzical recently published did not clearly show a decrease in uh, cases of melioidosis associated with a rollout of an educational program, although there were some other secondary, secondary benefits. So prevention is really important, but how to do it and um, how to do it so that it's actually effective uh, remains to be uh, figured out. I have no doubt that those um, there's those who are trying to figure out how to also mobilize community resources for better education over those areas. Um, there was a question about the outbreaks in the Gulf Coast, uh, Coast sorry. Um, the Gold Coast has substantial rice farms. Why do you think that melodosis is still relatively unusual there? Ooh, now that's a good question. And I can't say that I know a lot about the Gulf Coast myself. Um, um, you know, I will say, though, that in Thailand, there is patchiness to the um, B. pseudomallei that's uh, sort of residence in the soil. And it's not fully understood why. And so there are some thoughts that particular types of soil and salinity and uh, so forth may be more hospitable to Burkholderia pseudomallei, but um, I suspect there's more to the story than we currently understand. And that may um, partly explain some of the, uh, well, explain what you've just uh, just described. Um, I'll also just say, because I didn't mention it earlier, that you know, Burkholderia pseudomallei is a remarkably hardy pathogen, and it can survive in distilled water for decades. It can survive in bottles of beer, in um, soft drinks, and so forth, aromatherapy sprays. Um, so it's a it's a it's it's a survivor. Um, uh, but uh, but to the, you know, the answer to your question is that I'm not entirely sure, but I suspect it's it's something related to the specific makeup. Uh, of the environment. We're also getting several questions about secondary infections and mortality. Uh, specifically, um, there is a patient that one of our providers had seen at UW with spinal melodosis, and they were uh, had risk factors of 
diabetes and had acquired it in Thailand, and they had a secondary infection with aspergillus. Um, this uh, provider was mentioning uh, or asking if um, are co-infections common? Generally, no, I think is the short answer. Although um, I'd say also that we know that the longer you look after patients who are critically ill, there is an increased likelihood that they will get some sort of additional infection. But no, there isn't, for example, a literature suggesting that aspergillus or other infections commonly um, coexist with melioidosis. Uh, that may reflect, in some cases, a lack of looking for them, though. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't rule it out as a possibility. It just hasn't been demonstrated yet. Great. And I also want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I'll take this last question here um, before we close for the day. What are the potential mechanisms for diabetes risk for acquisition and outcome? Has that been looked into? Yes, there's been a fair bit of work trying to understand why diabetics are more susceptible. And it's well known that there are some alterations in innate immunity in diabetics and phagocytosis and immune function, neutrophil function and so forth that may uh, predispose diabetics to Burkholderia pseudomallei. What we don't know is really how the diabetic lung um, may respond differently to B. pseudomallei, however. Uh, that's something that I've um, been trying to investigate. Um, and uh, I'd also make the point that diabetes among melioidosis patients is not associated with a worse outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, so while it is a risk factor for susceptibility, it's not actually a risk factor for death uh, amongst melioidosis patients. Um, and, uh, there was one concern, one, there's been a report or two suggesting that glyburide therapy may actually be, be beneficial, uh, in protecting diabetics against poor outcomes. Although we did a similar analysis in our recent multi-center study and did not actually find that to be the case. So. Oh. Well, thank you again, Dr. West, for joining us today and sharing your expertise. Um, if you could see the chat box, a lot of folks are just saying, great talk. So they learned so much. We're taking away with a lot of learning points, um, just the general awareness of melodosis and the way it affects our patients. Um, and so thank you so much for providing your expertise um, for everyone. We look forward to seeing everyone again in two weeks for our next Grand Rounds of 2023.